you can either use the um, raised hand button at the bottom under reactions, or you can add your question in the chat. And then um, Chris will be able to answer these for us. If I can yeah. stop sharing my screen, yeah. I will pass you over to Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming. Just going to now share my screen and hopefully we can get this show on the road. OK, Alison, can you see that OK? Yes, thank you, Chris. That's good. Wonderful. Now, let me just see if I can move the image of everyone. Great. So what time are we? 33. All right, shall I shall I get going? It seems like a good enough time. Thank uh, you. Brilliant. But yeah, once again, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, today I'm going to be talking on, on the topic of burgers for breakfast. Um, and I'm going to try and answer as best as I can in this uh, 30 to 45 minutes um, whether we should eat, we should think about eating foods in unusual context uh, to help us manage our weight. Um, just as a brief overview, so I'm a lecturer in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University, and my specific uh, expertise and discipline is in behavioural nutrition and public health. So basically, I look to use psychological theory and psychological interventions to help people improve their nutrition. And I'm going to show you today some of the research that I've been doing over the last uh, six years or so, um, and hopefully you'll have a take home message. But as I say, this is the title I'm going to speak to. Um, and if my screens, my slides will move, there we go. This is a picture that I took on Saturday, just a, a few days ago, um, which was at Boo Burgers in Foss Park in, in Leicester. Um, and it, uh, such wonderful timing to get this, uh, to see this photo, because you can see here that Boo Burgers are advertising the things they want to do. They have mostly at, at their uh, eatery. They do burgers, they do breakfast, and they do coffee. And when I saw this, I thought, well, coffee can be part of breakfast. I can see that. So I wonder whether burgers are also part of breakfast in their in their offering. And I went into the, you know, went into the shop, had a look, and looked online. And no, burgers were not on their breakfast menu. Instead, on their breakfast menu, they had brioche buns, maybe with some bacon or some sausages in or sort of an egg muffin, but no burgers anywhere near. And this is exactly what I'm talking about in, in terms of my talk. Why not burgers for breakfast in that situation, especially when some of those breakfast options are the same as a burger in many instances, i.e. sausages or bacon are just pieces of meat between uh, two pieces of bread, if you have that in, in a bap or a cob or a roll, whatever you call it. And that's very similar to what a burger is. Now, I should say at this point, I'm not sort of just only presenting here about burgers. This is the concept of eating particular foods in unusual contexts. Um, and what, what, we're, what I'm going to introduce then is this idea of food to context associations. Um, with burgers, it'd be that you might associate it with a context such as lunch or dinner time, or maybe in a specific location um, where you wouldn't associate it for, for breakfast potentially. Um, and we have these food to context associations across our diet, and we see it many different ways. For example, if you have a look at this set of foods and I would say which meal time would you associate that with many people would say that that's their breakfast foods if I showed you this uh, roast chicken dinner um, which day might you associate a roast chicken dinner with and many people in the UK would say Sunday Sunday dinner time um, if I were to show you this which location which place which context might you think about if when you saw this image of, of popcorn um, and many people would say the cinema. And there's loads and loads of these. And the really fascinating thing is I've shown you some of these and a lot of these food to context associations can be seen across a whole culture. It, this, these associations might be shared between many of you on, on this call. Um, but then there are also food to context associations that are individual to, to you. So if I showed you uh, 
fish and chips. Um, you might have a specific context, uh, location, time of day, um, uh, potentially just a time of year that you would associate consuming uh, fish and chips. Same for a cup of tea. It might be in your house that there's, there's a place that you drink your cup of tea, uh, maybe a certain time of day, not other times of day. Um, and anything like a, a box of, of chocolates, other options of course are available, um, but you might have a specific time of year that you would consume uh, celebrations or, or you know, chocolates like this. It might be that it's a holiday celebration or a birthday celebration. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the key thing here is that people might think, you might think, that this is all quite kind of obvious. Well, of course, I associate these with these times of day, these contexts, these locations. But what we know is there's no nutritional, no physiological, no medical reason as to why particular foods should be associated with particular contexts. There's no reason that popcorn should be associated with the cinema based on the nutritional properties of the popcorn and what that does in regard to its interaction in our body and what that, that does for us nutritionally. Um, same with all of these foods, there's no reason why a Sunday dinner is associated with Sunday. It's just that over a long period of time, we have learned that certain foods are associated with certain contexts. And this, this starts from a very, very early age. Our preferences as to what foods we, we like, uh, our associations and our routines around certain foods, they start to form at a very, very early age and they're influenced by a variety of environmental factors. Um, so for example, research has shown that foods, uh, that food intake of pregnant mothers can influence the future, future food preferences of the unborn child. There was a study in uh, 2001 by Julie Manella and, and colleagues that found that influence had exposure to the flavor of carrots in either amniotic fluid or in uh, breast milk behaved differently in response to that flavor in a food base months after the child had been born compared to people who hadn't had that exposure. So very, very early on, we start to see that certain foods that we associate with and like um, are influenced, that are, the liking of that is influenced by various environmental factors. It carries on into the weeding, the, comp, the weaning, the complementary feeding stage. Um, a review by Lucy Chambers and colleagues showed that if you introduce vegetables first, frequently and in variety uh, during weaning, so you know when foods other than milk are first introduced, uh, that this can increase acceptance of vegetables during this period and into childhood. Uh, and this sort of continues uh, throughout life. Um, and we see that, you know, as to why foods are offered at particular times of day in particular locations for particular reasons as well. It's all massively influenced by different factors in our environment relating to our cultural, societal and many of our familiar norms. Um, when a child starts being offered cereal at breakfast time, for example, after repeating that continuously, the child starts to form these associations of cereal at breakfast time. And we, we know that it's between the ages of around two to three years old that a child may form what we call these script-based categorizations about foods and context. So and this, this will vary between children, but um, that cake is at birthdays, as an example. That'll make notes. Like, uh, by the age. Um, oh, like an email, you mean? Th uh, two and three years old. <clears throat> and so it's these early patterns of eating that the child procures that are continually reinforced. And it's reinforced by parents, caregivers, peers, marketing uh, across a whole culture and down into the, to the individual family throughout childhood that starts to form these food to context associations. And we wanted to look at it in a little bit of work as to whether these carried on into adulthood. Um, and we did a little bit of work looking at this. Um, and we, we had some quite strong evidence that these food to context associations do carry on into adulthood. As you can see here in the top left hand graph, um, we've got 11, uh, 12 different foods, which are all the same on all, all the four graphs. Um, and what we asked people to do is to say um, whether they had previously consumed these foods at particular times of day, breakfast time, lunch time, breakfast time and lunch time, or neither breakfast time nor lunch time. Uh, and you can just see visually on that top left hand graph that porridge, special K, 
Cheerios, Rice Krispies, they were very much associated with breakfast time. People who can previously consume them at breakfast, whereas chicken salad, chicken sandwich, spag bowl, cheese tomato pasta, lasagna, fish and chips and peas weren't associated with breakfast time. And you can see that opposite on the top right hand graph where you see that they are all much more associated with lunchtime. And again, it might be, yeah, well, obviously that's that's the case. Um, but what I think is so wonderfully arbitrary about some of our food to context associations, it can be seen in the bottom left hand graph. The one that sort of looks like a tower block in the middle, that's saying that the bacon sandwich, wonderful bacon sandwich, uh, people associated it with breakfast and lunchtime. Whereas if you look at the lunchtime um, uh, graph in the top right hand corner, the chicken sandwich, which is highly associated with lunchtime, wasn't at all in the top left hand graph associated with breakfast time at all. And yet a chicken sandwich and a bacon sandwich are incredibly similar. They're just meat between two pieces of bread. And there's no reason as to why one is associated with two times a day and one is only associated with one. And as to how this um, comes about, um, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's introduced throughout of our life and it's based on learning. It's based on associative learning. And for those of you who aren't uh, aficionados of psychology, or maybe those who are uh, pop psychology enthusiasts, um, I'll introduce you to Pav Pavlov's dog and the concept of conditioning, which is a concept of associative learning. We have a dog here that as a natural salivation that occurs as a response to the presentation of food. Uh, but there's no natural response of salivation when a bell is rung. Um, but if you continually pair the food, that natural response of the salivation with the stimulus of the bell ringing, over time, the dog will start to associate the bell ringing with the food and the salivation will occur in a response to the bell, even without the food there. And that's conditioning, it's associating certain cues and certain responses. Um, and this is what we see in the, the, the food to context learning environment. This very blank sated human, this is a conceptual model of it, um, would have a, a natural response liking of food. Um, but there's no natural response at all to lunchtime, whatever that might be, whatever time of day that might be. Um, but if you continually pair that food with a particular context, a particular time of day in this instance, um, these food and context associations start to form and they really influence us um, quite significantly in terms of the foods that we choose and the amount of foods that we choose. Um, but we didn't really know this in much detail. But the reason I've sort of said this is sort of how the learning occurs, but at a deeper level, at a sort of evolutionary level, um, you can see this is my caveman here. Um, we think about why we have this conditioning that occurs. Why do we learn about foods being appropriate in certain contexts and not in others? when nutritionally there's no difference between the foods in those different contexts. We can take it back to our primal roots. Um, if there are different ways to go to get food so that you know, ultimately you, you survive, it might be that there's one route that is tried and tested to get food berries at the end of it. And this is passed down maybe through generations of your tribe, maybe even tribe to tribe. Um, and over a period of time, people start to realize that that context, that location, that route, those routines that people go through to get those foods are safe. There's no predation risk and it hasn't led to famine or the berries killing you. If you have another route, though, even if those berries look very similar, all of those questions, if it hasn't been tried and tested before, remain unanswered still. You're not quite sure whether those berries are the same berries as in the other bush? Will these berries kill you? You don't know that going down that route to obtain food and to stop starvation uh, is not gonna be at risk, you're not gonna be at risk of predation. Um, and so that's what we see in the, in the current day. We see that going down one route to get a food which is tried and tested is where we start to associate foods in certain contexts and certain routines. Whereas if we present just the same food, but in a different context, we become wary of it based on these sort of uh, evolutionary uh, psychology and our, our roots there. So this is where my research sort of 
springboarded uh, off from, I wanted to know if we learn about foods or experience foods within a good, in given context, how key is that context in shaping the expectations and the behaviours we have when eating a particular food? So we might think that there are certain properties that a food might have that we believe are quite inherent to that food based on its uh, structure, uh, whether that's sort of sensory properties or maybe it's nutritional value. But I was really interested as to how the context shapes those expectations and behaviours that we actually have. And from that, when we know that there are fewer risks associated with uh, going down the unknown route, as we saw in the sort of the evolutionary shape of things, um, are there then any benefits for our health and well-being to breaking these learned food to context norms that we see? We, or we know that we go down these uh, tried and tested structures and pathways to obtain food, but why? what are the benefits if we actually went outside of those and introduced uh, foods in unusual contexts? So that's what I sort of said about uh, looking at. Um, and I chose uh, during my, my PhD, I chose a few variables to look at. Um, I firstly chose expected satiety. Now, expected satiety is our perception about how filling food or a portion of food is going to be before you eat it. So we learn about how satiating, how filling a food is and how much it's going to stave off hunger until the next meal by frequently consuming foods. And the more you consume a food, the more you start, you know how filling a portion is going to be for you. And so these expectations that we have before we select a food, how much is that influenced by the food to context association? Are they the same? Are your perceptions about how filling a food is gonna be the same if you have the food in the usual context versus an unusual context? I then uh, looked at eating rate, the speed at which we eat food, again, can be quite inherent to a food structure. Um, if a food has got a more chewy texture, it takes us longer to eat it versus, versus if it's a liquid. Um, but how much does the context influence that? And then food intake as well. How much do we actually consume of that food, select and consume of that food? Um, and as a, a very brief whistle stop tour of three years uh, work, worth of work, uh, over the course of six different papers, um, what we found is that in an unusual context, so if you picture pasta at breakfast time or burgers at breakfast time, um, what we found is that in an unusual context, we tend to select less of the food to eat. Now, that might seem really obvious again, because you just don't want that food at breakfast time. It's unusual and you might think it won't taste that nice. But that's the really interesting thing. These are foods that we selected because we knew these people liked these foods. And it might just be a different room, a different context, a different a few hours in the day that meant that it was gone from uh, it went from being a really, really palatable and, and food that they really wanted to eat to actually this is a bit unusual. And they selected less of that highly liked food for them to eat. And then ultimately they ate less of that food. We know that people engage in plate cleaning activity quite a lot. So the amount that you select on the food, you tend to clear your plate from that. Um, but because it was less food, uh, people that were selected, there was less food that was consumed. People actually also ate the food slower. And we know what most of the reason as to why that is, and that's because smaller portions are consumed slower than larger portions. But there's also a question which was currently unanswered at the moment about actually whether people are more attentive to the food as well. If we go back in evolutionary times again and try to think about that, it might be that you're not quite sure whether you're going to like this food. Is this food going to be a potential contaminant for you? You know, could it, could it kill you? And so eating it slower, being more mindful of it and understanding, do I like this taste? Is this doing anything improper to, for my digestion or whatever it would be? Um, that's a study that we still need to go and do to look at whether people are more attentive to the food in an unusual context. But ultimately, people eat slower. And what that means is that food is more filling. And we see that on two ways. The first one is that our expected satiety that I talked about earlier uh, is influenced by the context. So people think that a smaller portion is going to be more filling calorie for calorie than when that same food is presented 
in a usual context. So people have that perception that it's gonna be more filling, calorie for calorie, forehand, and then because they consume less food, we were wanting to know, well, if you consume less of this food, are you just as full at the end of the meal in the unusual context versus when you would normally consume it? And what we've found is that they were just as full after eating less of that food in an unusual context compared to in the usual context. So this was all really fascinating. Um, but to turn this into a little bit more real world scenarios, I've got a, a, a stooge and a video to show you exactly what I mean. Uh, so have a listen to this. So let me show you what I mean with a real world example. So I'm going into my fridge here and I'm collecting a lovely pre-cooked tofu curry that my partner has made for us and bulk made. Uh, and then I'm gonna go into the living room and I'm gonna select a portion of that food that I'm going to eat. So sitting down at the table here, um, I'm gonna tell you that this currently is lunchtime. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna self-select a portion. Um, for lunch, I would normally select all of this for my lunch. Uh, it's really, really tasty. I like this food uh, quite a lot. Um, and that's, so that's the amount that I'm going to consume for, for my lunch. When I eat this, I'm used to having this at lunchtime. So I'll eat it at a certain speed. I won't think actually too much about consuming it because I'm so used to having it, it's become habitual. I won't think as to whether I really like this because I have it every single day and I'd likely consume all of that food. Now let me take your mind into a different situation. Picture now that this is now breakfast time. It is breakfast time and I'm gonna do exactly the same with the same tofu curry. Let's say this is un an unusual thing for me to have tofu curry at breakfast time and I'm gonna self-select a portion. In an unusual context, what we tend to do is we tend to select a smaller portion of that food. Maybe let's say something like that. We're then much more attentive to the food when we're consuming it because it's unusual and in more evolutionary terms we wouldn't be sure as to whether this food because it's been acquired down a different path to what we would normally do would be safe for us we now translate translate that into the current day with not knowing whether this food in this unusual context is also going to be safe for us so we'll eat it slower we'll be more attentive to how it tastes whether we like the taste or not whether we like the texture or not Eating it slower will mean that we become more satiated, fuller, quicker in terms of the amount of calories, energy, that we're going to consume. And overall, our perception is, in this unusual context, that this food will be more filling, more satiating, calorie per calorie, compared to exactly the same food in a usual setting. So that's what I mean by having foods in unusual contexts and us interacting with them differently. So back to Chris now in the room. Chris. Um, so the, hopefully that just puts it in a little bit more real world context, what I'm sort of talking about. And so from all of those results that we've got so far, really, we've got some evidence there to suggest that eating foods in unusual context may be beneficial for managing our food intake because people consume less of that food that they like. Um, and they're just as full at the end of it. But as I say, they, they have less of it and potentially over the course of a whole diet that might have implications for the amount of energy that we consume overall. Um, this has some potential applications. I must say that all of that research was done in an experimental laboratory setting. So we're looking at sort of mechanistic underpinnings there of understanding uh, why we eat certain foods in certain ways in, in certain contexts. In sort of a real world application, there has got some potential applications from it uh, for, for weight management. We could think about whether something like a swap diet might be something we're going to we're going to test where people have exactly the same foods within their diet. They just consume it in unusual contexts at different times of day in different locations. Potentially, it might be that people can continue to have the foods that they like in their diet, but they just eat them in smaller portions. And that might actually help overall to, to manage people's energy intake during the day. Um, that's a question mark that I have. Another question mark I have is around food people maybe really crave or, or really desire and potentially they really crave that and, and end up overeating compared to what they would want to eat. I question as to whether eating that food that is highly craved in an unusual context 
instead of having to eliminate a whole food from a diet because, for example, you're trying to manage your weight because you know that you often crave that food and your cravings uh, get so, so much that you would then overindulge in it. Uh, is there a potential that actually we can make people consume that in a smaller, in, a, in an unusual setting and they still are able to consume it, but in a smaller portion and they don't break uh, they're restrained and actually go and overeat it. These are these are questions that we have, but it's got some potential applications for weight management. But to date, I've uh, taken it with colleagues into into different locations, real world application wise. And one of them is about vegetables. Um, we know in the UK, uh, vegetables are often associated with lunchtime for snacks and at dinner time. Vegetables in the UK are not regularly associated with breakfast time. But in other countries across the world, raw vegetables, vegetables in general, are often served as part of breakfast time. You think about continental buffets and think about the raw peppers and cucumbers and tomatoes. We're counting tomatoes as a vegetable. Get what I mean? We see a lot of those across the world in, in many different cultures, but just not in the UK. So what are the barriers to serving vegetables at breakfast time in the UK when we know vegetables are good for our health? And how would people in the UK respond to being offered vegetables at breakfast time? It's the questions that I have, because potentially if you open up another time in the day for people to eat vegetables, it means that over the course of their whole day's consumption, they might consume more vegetables and that maybe translate to a wider, their wider diet. Um, we looked at this initially um, with children in the veggie break project, which is working uh, with uh, Professor Emma Haycraft and Professor Amanda Daly. Um, and the aims of this were to explore whether offering vegetables to children at breakfast is an acceptable and an effective intervention to increase children's willingness to eat vegetables at breakfast and ultimately looking at their daily vegetable intake. Um, so this is an application of breaking these sort of social norms of why, where foods, which context foods are sort of appropriate across the board in the UK to be consumed and seeing whether there's actually a potential benefit for our health if children are open to it. So we've published a couple of papers so far. This is a photo of me back a year and a bit ago with a, a load of vegetables uh, and we had a team of us um, preparing these vegetables and sending them around to nurseries. Um, and we, we have some feasibility results. So a feasibility trial, uh, for those who aren't aware, is where you look to just assess whether your logistics, basically, your just basic idea that you put forward as to how you're going to test this idea, um, whether it's feasible at all. Is it acceptable in any respect to the target population that you're trying to, to help with this before you go on to test whether it's a really effective intervention, for example, for health? So feasibility wise, what we found is that we were able to recruit eight nurseries from the 12 nurseries that uh, were contacted, which is a quite good translation from contracted to recruitment. Um, we then managed to recruit 351 children across those eight nurseries. And based on our uh, predetermined criteria, that was actually a really good um, uh, recruitment rates that we were we were happy with considering we were looking for consent from every single parent of the children um, the staff the nursery staff were actually the people who were collecting the data for us they were noting down on sheets how many vegetables the children ate each day during this three-week intervention where children were offered vegetables raw carrots raw cucumber in a pot alongside their main breakfast food, such as whether it was cereal or toast. And the nursery staff were noting that down. And it was only 4% of the data collection cells that we expected them to, to complete. It was only 4% that were blank. So that was, again, pretty good for us. And one of the most important ones that we were really interested in is children's willingness to eat the vegetables at breakfast. And six out of 10 attempts or times that a child was offered the vegetables, uh, they ate some part of those vegetables in six out of those 10 instances. Um, and based on what we were expecting, looking at um, and hoping for, um, because we think this is a potentially beneficial intervention, um, that, that hit the bill for us. So now we're looking to go and move that on to a larger scale trial and test whether it's really effective at doing what we had proposed it would do. There's another application. Instead of breaking the social norms about when a food should be consumed, like we did with vegetables there and putting them at breakfast, what 
this study is about is looking at uh, Fortisip, which are these uh, very low uh, volume, high calorie drinks that are given often to older adults or people in end of life care or people who are infirm um, to get a lot of nutrients in uh, without them having to consume that much in terms of volume. But they're really poorly adhered to when they are um, administered by uh, primary care staff. Uh, older adults and people who have them don't tend to adhere to that prescription very well at all or what they're told to have, which is two each day. And we wanted to know why that would be. And a question that I had is whether, it, because these haven't got a normalized context in which people would normally consume them, when they're told to just consume two a day, they've got nothing to latch that onto that they're used to or that's been reinforced over the years. So our question, and this is uh, some research that uh, I'm doing with Marion Hetherington, Professor Marion Hetherington and uh, Dr. Jason Thomas and Dr. Lewis James. Um, we're looking at whether a more structured prescription of these all nutritional supplements in older adults can increase older adults adherence to them so creating and reinforcing a food to context association might actually help people remember and know when to add how and where to add them into their diet so that's the sort of other side of the coin instead of sort of breaking the social norms that are already created the other side is that we could create and reinforce the food context norm to help people with their health and their diet as well now, this is the, always the great bit with research is there's always a, a but that comes in. Um, and it's really important in research because we can have this great idea. We can think of these potential applications, potential reasons why this occur. Um, and this, this you know, might sound like me. You know, eating foods in unusual contexts is going to solve everything. Um, reality is uh, other research comes in and reminds me always to consider it and place it, this idea in the wider context to see whether this has got potential application. Um, and the area of research that really is the, uh, the question mark as to how applicable um, eating foods in unusual context or changing the food to context norms are in helping us with our diet and our food um, is, the, is the work on variety. Uh, the variety of foods we have, both within a meal and within a diet. So across our culture in the UK at the moment, we see that the variety of foods that are on offer to us is, has greatly expanded over the years. This is an example of a potential breakfast option now that's starting to be introduced uh, in, the, in the UK. We see it's come across from the United States. This is fried chicken and waffles with maple syrup and some butter. That's a combination that hasn't previously been normalized in the UK. And so you can see here that within a individual plate, there's greater, greater variety than people would be used to. And we see this variety in the single plate happening for, for different reasons. But a lot of them for companies is to differentiate themselves from uh, their competitors and to have a, a sort of USP and to, to take advantage of the fact that um, humans like different flavors and different textures. Um, and so we see this inc in increase in the type of variety within a, a meal itself that's continued to creep into our society. And ultimately, variety within a meal isn't a bad thing. It's just something that we need to be uh, aware of. And I can show you why in a second. Um, and then you can see it in, in different ways as well. Um, we see that uh, foods like cornflakes, uh, they used to be, it used to be advertised as the sunshine breakfast between the 1960s and the 1990s. It used to be that there's a very specific context and this was, you would have this with milk and that's the way that you would consume it and it would be breakfast time and that's reinforced by the packaging. Um, and what we see now from 2000s onwards, um, if you go and pick up a cornflakes packet today, you'll see that there's no, there's no reference to breakfast at all on that packaging. The company, Kellogg's, has started to normalize the consumption of, uh, of, uh, of, of cornflakes across the day. And that is sort of uh, led both by the consumer, but also by the company itself, because the more people consume it throughout the day, the more that they're going to consume, the more they're going to buy, the more that Kellogg's are going to, to sell. Um, but the main point that I want to make here is that the food to context norms that we would previously have seen are being blown out the water again. Instead of it being breakfast time, we're seeing that the variety of options available to us 
are expanding. Cornflakes are now not just for breakfast. You can have them throughout the day. You can see this also with Elevensies bars. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers Elevensies bars, but they were very, very uh, strongly marketed to being consumed at a very specific time for a specific reason. Nowadays, we don't see that. The Nutri-Grain Raisin Bake Bars, which are exactly the same, but they don't have that context reinforcement. So what, what this does ultimately is we have a greater variety of options available to us throughout the day. And foods such as these are becoming normalized to have it in many, many different contexts. And then within those contexts, individual meals are becoming more varied and have more options available to you as well, like I showed you with the chicken and the waffles. And the reason why this we've got to be wary of this is that increasing the variety in taste, texture, appearance, and the choice of foods that someone has, it's been shown in many studies to increase food intake within a meal and across a diet and it's associated with higher weight status. And these are just some examples. So this is one, If I, what I'm basically trying to say here is that if I'm looking to try and break these food to context norms to say that people consume foods in unusual contexts throughout the day, it doesn't matter why, you, you know, whether the context is previously or socially congruent or usual, you can consume foods for whatever reason. Um, and if that, if I'm saying that, I'm increasing people's variety of options available to them in each meal. And the, how that looks like in reality, this could be someone's breakfast, which on the whole, uh, there are worse breakfasts to have some bran flakes with raspberries, orange juice and, and a tea. Um, if, if I'm saying to someone, no, you can actually break the, this norm of consuming uh, bran flakes at breakfast time because there's actually a potential that if you chose a different food an unusual food in this context you eat less of it than you would do in a in a sort of normalized context what that could look like as a very basic message is saying to people yeah you can have a foot long sub from subway at breakfast time or you can have this double big mac for breakfast time because you know you might eat less of it than you would do at another time in the day but ultimately you might be consuming more energy, more nutrients uh, from consuming the burger at breakfast time, even if you have a smaller portion to when you would consume it in a normal context, compared to your consumption of your regular breakfast. So this is where I've got to be very careful with this and where our research, we have, my research has got to continue because ultimately saying to people that they can have a double Big Mac uh, burger for breakfast is probably not going to be as beneficial as a generalized rule uh, than saying people should have some bran flakes for, for breakfast. So I, I sort of started this talk and saying, you know, burgers for breakfast, you know, sh should we break these food to context norms uh, to support weight management? Should we break these food to context norms to support optimal health and well-being? Um, and where I've got to at this point in my in, in this line of research that, I, that I've been doing is that's not the question now, I think, um, because there's some potential benefits that we can see to playing with these uh, reinforced, heavily reinforced norms about why we consume certain foods in certain contexts. There's certain benefits in certain contexts. There's also certain detrimental possibilities if we break these food to context norms in terms of what people could then select. So the question now actually is, is when should we break these food to context norms to support our optimal health and well-being? And so we need to do a little bit more work on that. Um, but hopefully that's been an interesting talk over the last 40 minutes or so for you. Um, I want to thank a lot of collaborators that I've worked with on, on this work. Um, without it, it would not be possible and all the support people give to this, uh, this line of work, uh, which can potentially seem a little bit out there, um, but it has got some really good real world application and understanding of how we actually eat food and why we choose certain foods. And for various parts of that research, I just want to thank the funders who have uh, funded the work as well. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I would be uh, very open to taking any questions that anyone has uh, about anything that I've said or slightly more broader than that. Um, I'll see what that I can do.